All right, I think we're ready to begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And then you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit has instructed the hearts of the faithful, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith to me, These words of God are true. So we come now to the consideration of the Apocalypse as a liturgical text, a, a book about liturgy, about the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is really um, the principal focus of the book I re recommended by Scott Hahn. The Apocalypse is the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the structure of the Apocalypse is basically a liturgical structure. The first 11 chapters are really like the liturgy of the word. You have the letters to the churches, which, which we talked about earlier today. Um, in the first three chapters, especially in, the, in two and three, in the letters to uh, the churches, uh, our Lord is calling them to repentance. In fact, he says repent eight times in the first three chapters. So it's like the penitential rite at the Mass. You know, there's two parts to the Mass. There's the liturgy of the word, and there's the liturgy of the Eucharist. And the penitential uh, rite in the Mass is the first part of the Liturgy of the Word. So it's the same way in the Apocalypse. There's a penitential rite, and then there's this Liturgy of the Word. The, the letters to the churches, the opening of the scroll, um, uh, and at the very beginning, you know, when our Lord first speaks in the third verse of the book, he says, uh, Blessed is he that readeth and heareth the words of this prophecy and keepeth those things which are written in it. So not only reading it, but hearing it, you know, like in the liturgy of the word where the, the gospel, the, the word of God is publicly proclaimed to the people. And then in, in, in the, uh, the, the, the beginning with the opening of the, of the temple and the end, the end of the 11th chapter, you have the liturgy of the Eucharist. You have the angels with their seven bowls of wrath. Some, some translations say vials. Some translations say chalices. So they have these libations which they pour out. And then you have the supper of the Lamb. And throughout the book, there are many, many, many liturgical details. I can give you some examples. For example, in uh, chapter 8, verse 3, another angel co came and stood at the altar with a golden censer and was given much incense to mingle with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. So you have an altar, you have a censer, you have the angels present at the altar who are assisting uh, the saints who are participating in, in the liturgy. Uh, then again in chapter 4, verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clad in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads. And some interpretations of the book identify these elders as priests. They're serving at the altar of God. Um, and interestingly, in the Roman canon, there are 24 saints mentioned in the Roman canon in the, in the, in the first uh, Eucharistic prayer. Uh, then at the very beginning of the book, in chapter 1, you uh, have St. John saying, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, you know, the first day of the week, the day of the Lord, when we, when we uh, fulfill our Sunday obligation. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it 
to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands like the altars, like the candles on an altar. And in the midst of these lampstands, like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden girdle about his breast, dressed as the high priest. So more liturgical details. Then again, chapter five, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the <coughs> lamb, each holding a harp, liturgical music, with, with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of all the saints. In chapter two, verse 17, to him who conquers, I will give the hidden manna, which is the bread of life. Uh, then in uh, chapter 1, <coughs> verse 9 through 10, I, John, your brother, who share with you Jesus, the tribulation, in Jesus, the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of G Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet. Uh, so, you know, his participation in Sunday worship. Then in chapter four, I might have done this one, no, four, chapter four, verse eight. Um, this is important. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, like seraphs, all full of eyes, all round within, and day and night they never cease to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and who is, and who is to come. The song of the angels is precisely what we sing uh, before the Roman, before the, uh, lit, the, 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 um, lit, the, the Eucharistic prayer and every holy sacrifice of the mass, which is the song of the angels in the Old Testament and in the book of Revelation. Chapter 15, verses three and four. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, great and wonderful are thy deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are thy ways, O King of the angels, who shall not fear and glorify thy name, O Lord, for thou alone art holy. All nations shall come and worship thee, for thy judgments have been revealed. So this is a liturgical canticle, uh, similar, you might say, to the Gloria in, in uh, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And in fact, this canticle is used in the liturgy, in the, in the, uh, in, in the divine office. And there are other canticles taken from Revelations that are in fact used in, in the sacred liturgy. Then uh, chapter 14, verse one, then I looked and lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. What's that? Let me read that again. Then I looked and lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Anybody have a guess? the sign of the cross, you see, liturgical action, the, sign, the, the name of the father, uh, the name who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Then um, in chapter 19, verse uh, six and following, uh, after this I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude in heaven crying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are just and true. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever and they sing hallelujah two or three more times. Uh, but this is, you know, of course, the hallelujah in the liturgy and it also calls to mind that when we praise the Lord in the liturgy, we are engaging in, in spiritual combat. Christ is conquering in and through the church in the sacred liturgy. Um, so there are many liturgical elements. It's throughout, throughout the, the apocalypse. But the idea here is that there is a heavenly and an earthly liturgy and we participate in the heavenly liturgy. Again, we are in the present age, but we are already being invaded by the age that is to come. There is this unity between the church militant and the church triumphant. And what we hope for to experience, what we hope to experience in heaven 
has already begun in the church and in a particular way in the sacred liturgy. We say that the church is decked out in all her glory like a bride for her husband in the sacred liturgy. It's where we experience, um, you know, we have our fundamental experience of, of our salvation through the proclamation of the word of God and the reception and the participation in Christ's sacrifice uh, which culminates in, in the reception of Holy Communion. It's, it's the pinnacle of our life of worship, what we give to God. <coughs> and this is confirmed for us in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in Numbers 190, <coughs> excuse me, 1137, 1138, and 1139. It's all about, about um, the sacred liturgy and its relation to the heavenly liturgy. I'm not going to read all of it, but for example, in 1090, in the earthly liturgy, we share a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy, which is celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem, toward which we journey as pilgrims, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. With all the warriors of the heavenly army, we sing a hymn of glory to the Lord, venerating the memory of the saints. We hope for some part and fellowship with them, we eagerly await the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, until he, our life, shall appear, and we too will appear with him in glory. I want to go on just to the next one. The book, uh, which is 1137, the book of Revelation of St. John, read in the church's liturgy, first reveals to us a throne, <laughs> excuse me, in heaven, with one seated on the throne, the Lord God, then shows the Lamb standing as though it had been slain, Christ crucified and risen, the one high priest of the true sanctuary, the same one who offers and is offered, who gives and is given. Finally, it presents the river of the, of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, one of the most beautiful symbols of the Holy Spirit. And this is what we participate in the sacred liturgy, the section in which that um, uh, particular uh, passage comes from concludes in 1139 with it is in this eternal liturgy that the spirit and the church enable us to participate whenever we celebrate the mystery of salvation uh, in the sacraments all right remember when our lord met um, <clears throat> uh, the samaritan woman and talked about worship and spirit and truth you worship with you know because the samaritans uh did not worship in Jerusalem. They were sort of a, a, a schismatic, heretical sect of the Jews. Um, and, uh, and they had a dispute with, with the Jews about where God should be worshipped. They had their own temple, and the Jews had, of course, their temple um, in, in Jerusalem. And, and, and our Lord... Uh, in trying to bring the woman to conversion, talk to her about the true worship in spirit and truth. Uh, it's not about whether it's in Jerusalem or anywhere else. We, we worship in spirit because we participate in the heavenly liturgy in, in, a, in, a, in the fulfillment of all that was signified by the Old, Old Testament liturgy conducted in the temple. And uh, whereas God revealed himself to his people by manifesting his presence among them in the, the physical temple in Jerusalem. Uh, now, through the sacrifice of Christ, he is made present everywhere in the world for Jews and Gentiles in the holy sacrifice of the mass. That's worshiping in spirit and in truth because this is the fullness of the truth. The, um, the, the Old Testament worship in the temple was just a shadow. The real Lamb of God is Jesus Christ. He is the true Paschal Lamb. He is the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And only through him is there salvation. And that's what we, we, what's, that's what we live, that's what we participate in, that's what we live in the holy sacrifice of the Mass wherever it is celebrated. And this is true, <clears throat> you know, no matter how, you know, it is true in every sacrifice of the Mass. 
you know, no matter how humble the church and the liturgy may be, or how grandiose it may be, whether it's in the ordinary or the extraordinary form. And I think this is a challenge for us, especially, you know, when we sort of, we, we, we have our, uh, the experience of our, I think most of us in, in our experience have had what you might call uh, the experience of a liturgical apocalypse, where, where it seems like everything is coming undone and, and we are no longer experiencing the presence of Christ or uh, uh, it's very difficult, very, very difficult to find Jesus in, some t in the liturgies that sometimes we experience. You know, it's just a, I'm not judging, I'm just observing. I mean, we all have seen it in one way or, or another. <clears throat> Um, and yet, you know, that in its own way, in its own way, this experience is, is spiritual warfare. It's like, it's like what's going on uh, in the battle between the dragon and the woman, that we, should ex that we should see the apocalyptic struggle going on within the liturgy itself. They you know the struggle between the light and the darkness being, being found in the sacred liturgy itself uh, is, should not be any surprise, really. And I think we should all strive, no, no question, particularly priests, to, to, to bring about the restoration of liturgical life. Um, and yet at the same time, if we have much to suffer because, because of lit liturgy where we are, you know, uh, that is not something to be be, to become a cause of, um, of bitterness or, or too much consternation because it's all a part of the, of the ongoing struggle. And the church, you know, is doing what she can to, to bring about what Pope Benedict called the reform of the reform. The, 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 sacred council, the, the Second Vatican Council mandated a reform that was good and necessary and yet it was not al always and very often was not implemented properly. Uh, so, um, so, there, so uh, I, I want to talk then about um, <clears throat> one of the principal mandates of the Second Vatican Council with respect to the liturgy, which is active participation. I imagine most of you have heard this before. You know, you've, you've heard the term active participation. This was one of the fundamental reasons for the changes in the liturgy after the council, was to bring about a fuller and more active participation of all the faithful in the sacred liturgy. You know, for a priest who understands Latin and who has studied the liturgy, the old liturgy is, is, is a particularly enriching experience because you're able to um, see the sacred character of the liturgy, of the, of the mysteries that we celebrate, and the priest is able to appreciate the way the sacred liturgy ought to be celebrated, whether it's celebrated according to the old rite in Latin or, or in English according to the new rite. It's a helpful thing. Um, at the same time, however, you know, the church wants the faithful to participate in, deeply in the liturgy, and that was the reason for the changes. Unfortunately, what happened was in the liturgical apocalypse, the idea was that there wasn't any really different, any real difference between the priest and the laity, and the priests started acting like lay people, and lay people started acting like priests, and it became more and more about us and not about God. And this is one of the pr principal critiques that especially Pope Benedict had about the post-conciliar liturgical implementation is that God ceased to be in the center of the liturgy and the liturgy was more about us than it was about anything else. And so the, 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 the use of the vernacular and the participation of the faithful in, in more of the action of the liturgy in the offertory, you know, in being able to dialogue with the priest to respond it, 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 it didn't, didn't always have the desired effect. Sometimes it just turned into, you know, uh, 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 an experience which centered on us rather than God. This has been a big problem. And in some places, it can, you know, it continues to be a problem. Um, 
and and so everything that the church has been doing over over the last especially since since pope pope john paul but in particular through pope benedict was principally to restore the sense of the sacred and the fact that the god is the center of the liturgy and that we are there to worship him and that whatever we do uh, ought to to serve that purpose and so a lot of people have fallen in love with the old liturgy because it certainly is, is theocentric, it's God-centered. And, and it, preserves, it, pres it preserves in a particular way the sacred and mysterious character of what's going on in the liturgy. Um, but, but something is brought forward in a new liturgy when it's celebrated properly that is very helpful to the lay faithful if it's understood properly and it's, and, and it's embraced in the spirit in which the church has, has <coughs> offered it. And that's what's called active participation uh, in, a, in its proper sense. Because it's been mis this idea has been misunderstood as just doing stuff. You know, we, ought to, we need to do stuff. We need to be talking as much as we can, responding and singing, and people need to, you know, the, all kinds of people need to be doing stuff, bringing up the gifts, people in the sanctuary, lay people going to the tabernacle, all this stuff. The more stuff that everybody does, the more actively, actively we're participating. That wasn't what the council meant by active participation. Active participation is fostered by the use of the vernacular, the ability to respond during Mass, you know, the participation of the faithful in things like the offertory and the prayers of the faithful and that type of thing. These actions are meant to help us, help foster active participation, but they don't constitute it. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, in Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the, um, is the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, which was the first document that the Fathers of the Council worked on, in number 14, <coughs> Holy Mother Church says this, Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to, what, to that fully conscious and active participation in, lit in liturgical celebrations which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. So the council is saying because everybody, not just priests, all the faithful, lay faithful, are baptized, they have a reason to participate in the liturgy. And the reason for that participation is, um, properly speaking, priestly. So we are, we are all baptized priests, prophets, and kings. What does a priest do? He offers sacrifice. Everybody who is baptized is called to offer sacrifice. In the restoration of, in the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. So everything that changed, everything that was supposed to change, was supposed to change because it was meant to foster active participation. For it's, for it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit, and therefore pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of the necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. All right? So, everybody who's baptized is a priest who's called to offer sacrifice, and because of that is their right and duty to participate actively in the liturgy. So, what then do we mean by the priesthood? What is referred to as the royal priesthood of all the faithful? And what do we mean then by active participation? But well, before I answer that, I want to go on and read a little bit of Lumen Gentium, which is about the church, the dogmatic constitution of the church. And it talks about all the members of the church, you know, the hierarchy, the lay faithful, uh, religious and and the Blessed Mother in a particular way. Christ the Lord, high priest taken from among, among men, made the new people a kingdom of priests to God the Father. The baptized by regeneration and the anointing of the Holy Spirit 
are consecrated as a spiritual house and a holy priesthood in order that through all those works which are those of Christian man they may offer spiritual sacrifices and proclaim the power of him who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. So all of us who are consecrated into Christ through the Holy Spirit are called to, as a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. All right? So all of us are priests. But then this, this is the clarification offered by the Second Vatican Council as to what's the difference between the priesthood of all the faithful and the ministerial priesthood of those who are ordained into the sacrament of holy orders. Though they differ from one another in essence and not only in degree, the common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood are nonetheless interrelated. Each of them in its own special way is a participation in the one priesthood of Christ. The ministerial priest, by the sacred power he enjoys, teaches and rules the priestly people. Acting in the person of Christ, he makes present the Eucharistic sacrifice and offers it to God in the name of all the people. But the faithful, in virtue of their royal priesthood, join in the offering of the Eucharist. They likewise exercise that priesthood in receiving the sacraments, in prayer and thanksgiving, in the witness of a holy life, and by self-denial and an act of charity. So the priesthood of all the faithful differs not only in degree but, but in essence from the ministerial priesthood. But there is a real priesthood that is proper to baptism. Everyone who is baptized is baptized into the priesthood of Christ. And our, and our duty, our right and duty is to offer sacrifice to God. And as, and as followers of Jesus Christ, we offer his sacrifice. So the priest, the ministerial priest, acts in the person of Christ and offers the sacrifice in the name of Christ. And so through the priest, Christ is offering the sacrifice. But in union with Christ the priest and his minister, all the faithful join themselves to that sacrifice and offer the sacrifice as well. And that offering is pleasing to God. In fact, uh, the church has always taught that it is necessary it isn't necessary that it take place in every Mass. One of the sort of exaggerations of, of ideas that came out after the Council is that it's not really proper for a priest to celebrate Mass unless there's somebody present. Generally speaking, that is the rule. A priest should at least have a server present. But it's not like the Mass somehow is invalid and ineffectual if there's nobody present there. However, God wills that all the faithful participate in the offering. You're not just there as bystanders. You're not just there uh, you know, because you need to, to fulfill your obligation on Sunday and receive Holy Communion. Or, you, know, you, can't ordinarily, you don't ordinarily receive Holy Communion outside of Mass. You can, but the, the, but the ordinary place where you would receive <coughs> Holy Communion is within Mass. That's not the only reason you're there. You're there to participate in the sacrifice to assist at Mass and to offer the sacrifice in union with Christ and in union with the priest. That's the royal priesthood of all the faithful. And the council here says that um, you exercise the priesthood in receiving the sacraments in prayer and thanksgiving, in the witness of a holy life, and by self-denial and act of charity. So everything, you know, we say, uh, the, uh, probably some of you hopefully pray the uh, morning offering, and a lot of the morning <coughs> offerings talk about offering our prayers, works, and joys, our sufferings and sacrifices in union with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. You know, the prayers of, of the Divine Mercy Chaplet have this character as well of offering Jesus in, in the Mass. All of us are supposed to do that because everything that we do in our life, our prayers, works, so joys, sufferings, and sacrifices, take their meaning and value from the presence of Christ Jesus and his sacrifice in which we participate principally the lay faithful through the reception of Holy Communion in the Mass. We are, we are uniting everything. That's why the offertory was restored in the sacred liturgy uh, through the Council because it has the significance of, of the lay faithful bringing their gifts to the altar which symbolize bringing themselves to the altar and everything that they have. Who you are, 
what you do, what you suffer, what you experience is all brought to the altar and that is transformed in the Mass and offered up to God in Christ Jesus who is the sacrifice, who is the priest and the victim, the one who is offers and the one who is offered. We are united to Christ in our baptism. We are baptized into his death and participate in his resurrection. We live his life through grace and we are united to his sacrifice in the Mass. That is the priesthood of the faithful and that's active participation. <coughs> That's active participation. It's not, all the, it's not doing stuff. It's praying. It's living a contemplative life and joining to Christ our whole life in the liturgy, in the sacred liturgy. That's where, in a real sense, you might say the rubber meets the road, where we experience uh, the way in which the witnesses in the apocalypse, the 24 elders, the 44,000, the angels, in the, where we experience this transformative presence of Christ in, in our life, you know, in this present age. When we enter into the liturgy, we enter into a different kind of time. We enter into liturgical time, which is the presence of Christ in the here and now. We are, we are on Calvary when our Lord offered his sacrifice once and for all. Every sacrifice of the Mass is the unbloody representation, not meaning like, uh, uh, you know, presenting something that's like what happened, but the making <coughs> present of what actually did happen. We're making it happen again in a mystical, sacramental, unbloody way. So we're at Calvary in the Mass and we also are oriented towards eternity, facing east, facing eternity. Christ is, is standing before us and leading us into eternal life through his sacrifice. And not only are we personally being led there, but by our participation in the Mass, the whole world, you know, somewhere in the world, at all, every moment the Mass is being celebrated. And, and we're all praying and, and, and participating in such a way that, that all of history, the whole world, all of society is being led, uh, hopefully, to eternity. We are doing the best that we can in the Mass to, um, to make this happen. So, uh, it, the church is still working through uh, bringing about a re liturgical uh, reform or restoration or renewal. And it, it, as we all know, it hasn't been an easy process. This is something that the church has been talking about for actually quite a long time. What happened at the council was preceded by many years of discussion among theologians of, and bishops about about bringing about a new liturgical movement, a liturgical renewal. And it started off with the idea of, of helping people understand the liturgy better so that they could participate better. You know, it, it, it can happen, and it did happen in, in places where, where the old liturgy was in use, as it was universally throughout the church, that it was pretty much the domain of priests, and, and the lay faithful, uh, you know, were oftentimes praying the rosary or whatever and, and, and not fully cognizant of exactly what was happening in the sacred liturgy. Part of the liturgical movement before the council was to help educate people about what's taking place in the liturgy. That's where all the missiles came from, you know. That's where the hand missiles came from, where you had both the Latin and the English, and you, could, and you could read through the Mass and learn how to use the missiles so that you could follow where the priest was in the Mass and know what he, more or less what he was doing. And along with that came a, a lot of liturgical commentaries from, you know, some of them for priests, some of them for lay people. But there was this eff effort to bring about a deeper 
understanding of what takes place in the liturgy. And this culminated at the council with the, the decision to bring uh, the use of the vernacular into the liturgy and the simplification of the liturgy and, and, and the, the dialogue and all these other things that were supposed to help us enter more deeply into the, um, the, the, the mysteries that we celebrate. So, um, it ha has it been successful? Uh, well, you know, 50 years in the life of the church is really not a very long time. And there have been crises within the church uh, throughout its history. You know, and so we're, we're still uh, sort of getting our legs liturgically uh, on this particular reform. And part of it, according to Pope Benedict and, and confirmed by Pope Francis, is the is the more liberal use of the of the extraordinary form, you know? And I think rather than uh, contrasting or comparing the two forms, uh, I think the the more important thing is to recognize that there's there's um, two th different things emphasized. And I think you would also see this in the example of Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. It's two different things being emphasized. You know, the old rite and, and the high sort of liturgical culture of Pope Benedict emphasizes that Christ is the center of, of, of the liturgy. God is at the center of the liturgy. And it is, it is um, uh, essential that we, we recapture the sense of the sacred and put God at the center of the liturgy. And that, and that silence and reverence and, and, and sacred symbology are, are very helpful and necessary to do this. On the other hand, Pope Francis, who has a different liturgical perspective, has, has made it clear that, that, um, that participation in the liturgy is also relational. You know, it's God first, absolutely, but it's vertical and horizontal. Our relationship with God we're connecting with God, heaven is coming down to earth, but we're also doing it as the, pe as the people of God, as the body of Christ. And we are together in our, in our sinfulness and our woundedness and with all the baggage that we bring before, before the Lord, we are together lifting that up. And, and in the mass, in the presence of Christ within the mass, there has to be there has to be mercy and charity. You know, that's the whole point. And it's not to contrast one or the other. It's both and. One emphasis, you know, you can have a certain emphasize, emphasis in one and another emphasis in, another, in the other. But both of them help teach us something. And in a particular way, I, you know, I've heard people who love the old Mass say, you know, the fact that I don't understand it helps me appreciate the mystery. And, and, and the more I, I participate, the more I'm challenged and, 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 uh, and, the, and the more I, I grow closer to the mystery and, and, and seek to do so through prayer. That works for some people. It doesn't work for everybody. That's just the fact. You know, and the church isn't expecting anybody to prefer one or the other. The ordinary form, though, is the, uh, is the, is the, is the vernacular Novus Ordo Mass. And it's particularly suited to help people understand the fact that they have a priesthood and they are meant to offer spiritual sacrifices. And the more that we can understand the liturgy, and if it's, if it's the vernacular that helps us to do it, then that's a wonderful thing. And we should. But the point of the whole thing, whatever we do in, in, the, in the sacred liturgy, is for us to offer a spiritual sacrifice to the Father through Christ Jesus, through the offering of his sacrifice. You know, somehow the liturgy should help us carry our cross. It should help us to, to realize that the cross is, the, is our salvation and that we are not alone, that God is with us, that the Blessed Mother is with us, that the saints and martyrs and the holy angels are with us. And it's one sacred liturgy Christ the High Priest and all of heaven and all of earth are participating together in this offering. And that's our salvation. It happens in every Mass, no matter how poorly it's celebrated. God forbid that we should 
you know, let, you know, not do anything about helping to restore the liturgy. But, you know, and, and grandiose, beautiful liturgies help us to appreciate that heaven has come down to earth. But our faith should tell us that it happens no matter what. And that if we suffer in the liturgy, that we are still receiving the grace of God. You know, the, 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 um, the missal is not a magic book. You know, that if it's sort of, you put all the spells together and suddenly zap, you, you, if you do it right, the right way, you get, you get the grace. No, Christ is the high priest. The liturgy must be celebrated according to the norms of the church. Um, but, it, it, but the grace is present all the time, all the time. Um, I'm supposed to have a question for you, so I'm going I'm to wrap it up. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the seven angels who pour out the, 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 the plagues, the, 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 the various types of the wrath of God, are um, liturgical angels. It's a liturgical action. Um, and, and the crisis that appears in the apocalypse in the latter part of it with the, the woman clothed with the sun and, and uh, the, the beasts is all part of the liturgical life of the church. So there is a link between our liturgical participation and the crisis that we experience in, in, this, in this world. I want to conclude by... Um, Uh, by reading a little bit from chapter 5. If I can find out where I am here. Um, and, I, and I would just say, you know, if there's liturgical abuse, if liturgical abuse is something that's characteristic of, of the, um, the church of today, it reflects life. It's a reflection of life. and unf It's unfortunate that it should, it should enter into the sanctuary of God. But it's like life. You know, a dysfunctional <coughs> church re re reflects the dif dysfunction that w that's within our society. Dysfunctional priests reflect the fact that, that they have been, you know, influenced. But that's no surprise. The church is always struggling against the darkness. And it's only Christ that can save us from the darkness. And I saw at the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and without, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man was able, neither in heaven nor on earth nor under the earth, to open the book nor to look on it. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book nor to see it. And one of the ancients said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seal, seven seals thereof. And I saw, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the ancients, a lamb standing, as it were, slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And then he opened the book. So, Christ is the lion uh, where does it say this? Sorry. But behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. So he's a lion. And yet when John looks upon the lion, you know, the uh, one of the ancients says, Weep not to John, who's weeping because there's nobody there to open the scroll. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and uh, John look, turns around, what does he see? He sees a lamb. So the lion is a lamb, and the lamb is slain, but standing. Standing, but slain. This is Christ Jesus, who is the lion that conquers, but he conquers as a lamb, as a victim. All right? Christ reigns from the throne of the cross. As, as priest, and, and victim. And in his sacrifice, 
he is worthy to open the scroll, which is a sign of um, the fullness of divine revelation. When the scroll is opened, everything comes to fulfillment. And his, he is able to provide for all those who need to know what's on the scroll, which is the book, you know, the book of life, the, the, everything that we need to know to get to heaven is revealed to us through Christ Jesus, principally through his sacrifice, the fact that he has suffered and died on the cross and risen from the tomb and has given us the opportunity to live that mystery in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That is our, our victory. That is the grace that Christ has won for us and that he gives us in the sacred liturgy, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass and in the Eucharist. And it is our way to overcome this world, the holy sacrifice of the Mass and our active participation in it is the most important spiritual combat that we can engage in. More important than anything else. The Mass is spiritual combat. If you've got a problem in your life and you don't know what to do with it, you need to take it to the altar. If you, if you, if you feel like you really need to do something in your spiritual life and you're not getting to daily Mass, you're not getting to Mass as frequently as you ought, then get to Mass more frequently. It's there where it all happens. It's there where we get the graces. We get it in other ways as well, but that is the powerhouse of the church, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's where it all comes down from heaven. That's where heaven and earth meets. That's where God touches down on earth in the present moment, is in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. All right, so I got some questions. I've heard that there is a dispute that John who wrote the Revelations was a follower of the Apostle John, but not John the Apostle. I think the theory is based on differences in style, grammar, etc. that is distinct from the God. That's true. There is a, there is a distinct uh, 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 style to the Apocalypse. And, and it's an academic dispute, but the Church has always identified uh, the author of the of of the fourth gospel as also the author of, um, of, 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 of Revelation. You know, the gospel is a historical book. Uh, Revelation is a prophetic book. It's the only prophetic book of, of the New Testament. You've got all kinds of prophetic books. In the, you know, in, in the scripture you have historical books, you have wisdom literature, and you have prophetic literature. There's only one prophetic prophetic book in the New Testament, and that's the Apocalypse. That it should be different in style from, from, the, uh, from the Gospel shouldn't be all that much of a surprise, but there is this overarching commonality between the two, which is the theme of light and darkness. That's one, one, one thing. So, yeah, there are differences, but, you know, I think the, the, let the scholars, you know, hash it out as they always do. Um, you know, the, the, they're bookish and, and they have nothing better to do with their time, but um, I, I shouldn't be, I'm not, I don't mean to be cynical, but um, you know, the, 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 there are solid reasons to believe that, of course, that, that St. John the Apostle is the John of the Apocalypse. Uh, why, why is the Catholic Church so slow in recognizing the happenings of Medjugorje and our mother's desire to change men's hearts. So many people still say they haven't heard about it after 20, 30, 32 years. Why doesn't it just encourage people to check it out? Um, well, the, the jury is still out. The Church is slow in, in discerning these things. and. Uh, when, when you know, there have been prophecies and promises, uh, the church waits to see if they're fulfilled. You know, and uh, with you know, with all thing, all things considered, you know, there's still a great deal of opposition against the the, the apparitions from from bishops, including the local bishop. Uh, so. You know, in the recent uh, letter of, Car of Archbishop Mueller to the papal nuncio of this country, he said, we simply adhere to the determination of the, the bishops' conference of Yugoslavia, 
you know, there's three possible determinations for a private revelation. One is that uh, it is considered to be supernatural. Another is that, it's, that it is simply not supernatural. And the third one, which is the one that has been placed on Medjugorje by the Bishop's Conference, is that at this point it's not determined to be supernatural, which means it doesn't mean that it's not supernatural, it's simply at this point not determined to be so. You can argue at the Bishop's Conference on the matter, but again, you know, the same types of things happened with great, great saints and mystics like Padre Pio. Padre Pio had uh, people who thought, popes who thought he was the the next best thing to slice bread, and they had others who thought he was, he, he was a fraud, you know? And that's, that's the, the lot of those who are blessed, and you might say, uh, cursed with, with these kinds of graces. Padre Pio said, I'm not afraid of the justice of, of God, I'm afraid of his mercy, you know? Because in God's mercy, sometimes he asks us to suffer, because he, has to, he wants to purify us. And if uh, Medjugorje is um, authentic, you know, it will be confirmed and it will be good for the whole church. And it will be good for the purification of the church that, that uh, y you know, that there is suffering involved in this. Um, but, uh, y you know, we, we, need to, we need to be obedient and, and, and pray and have, and have trust in God. But the other part of this is, is too, you know, um, we live in an age that, that it's hard to have faith. It's hard to have faith. It's hard to persevere in, in faith. And faith is, first of all, faith in what Christ has revealed through his own divine revelation that comes to us through the church and was completed, public revelation was completed with the death of the last apostle. That is the saving revelation that God has given us. Everything that comes after that is either helpful, is, is relatively helpful, you know, to some extent it'll help us, hopefully. You know, but that's why the church says you don't have to believe in private revelation. It's why you know, some people have devotion to certain certain you know, things that have come through private revelation, and some, some do, some don't. And the church doesn't really make a big deal about it, officially. Because these are charismatic graces that have been given to individuals, and others who have, who have come in contact with it has, have experienced those graces as well. But it's not something given to everybody in exactly the same way. And so we need to, we need to always try to put these things into context and realize, you know, that it is the public revelation of Christ and, and the system that he set up in the church that saves us. Um, and, you know, uh, we could err on, on either side of, of the equation of being too reticent about private revelation or too, too cre credulous. And, um, you know, and today, it's not only the progressives, you know, the, the, or, or modernists, who are uh, claiming the right to pass judgment on the Holy Father and on the Church. It's everybody, y you know? Even the people that, that, that want to be faithful to the revelation of Christ and those who, who want to, to practice our holy religion in a strict way, put the Pope under a microscope. And um, we have to trust the church. You know, every trial that comes our way, even when the trial comes from the church itself, ought to lead us closer to the church. Padre Pio proclaimed his, his um, fidelity to Paul VI shortly before he died and never breathed a word against the church, even when he suffered because they misunderstood him because people in the hierarchy misunderstood him. You know, we need, we need to, we're, especially in these times, especially if we understand why Our Lady's coming and, and speaking to her people in this time, we need to live on a higher level. We need to trust God and trust the church and know that no matter what happens, that Our, that our Lady's will will come to pass. That Our Lady will 
will protect us from falling into error and that she will, whatever she wants is going to happen. We have to trust that. Uh, can you relate the first miracle performed by Jesus at Mary's request at the wedding Cana and her role in Revelations? So you're asking if there's a relationship between the, the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana and Revelations? Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought of it, but yeah, I would say there is because um, it is a wedding feast, okay? And, uh, y you know, things happen in the gospel in, in a very providential way, okay? What happens in the gospel, you know, there's the literal sense and then there's the spiritual senses. So there are thing, the things that happen in, in the things that are written in sacred scripture about historical events record actually what happened. So the words in the scriptures represent these events, but the events themselves represent other things. So are these, there are these la layers of meaning, meaning. So it was by God's design that our Lord worked his first miracle at a wedding feast. He was there at the wedding, and um, weddings were a big thing, are a big thing in Jewish culture, but particularly back then when life was particularly hard and you didn't have always a lot of, a lot of time to celebrate or whatever, wedding feasts became big things and they went on and on and on and on for days. And uh, having no, running out of wine at a, at a, at a wedding <coughs> feast was unthinkable. You can't, you can't run out of a wine at a, at a wedding feast. It's a, it's, it's a tremendous embarrassment and a scandal and an insult to your guests. So, uh, Our Lady goes there with Our Lord and, and uh, they run out of wine. Our Lady, in, in her very real, concrete, and, and uh, compassionate maternal care for this couple, didn't want them to be embarrassed. So she went to Our Lord and she asked for a miracle. She, she didn't really even ask for a miracle, she just simply said, they have no more wine, take care of it. You know. Um, uh, and and our, our Lord makes this statement, which is translated in various ways, but the old translation from uh, like the confraternity edition of, or, or the Dewey Reims is, is actually fairly accurate to the Greek, where um, our Lord says to her, to a blessed mother, do you realize what this means to, to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. Or what is this to me and to thee? What is this to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. It's not what does this concern of yours have to do with me. That's not what he said. He said, what is, uh, what is this to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. And uh, when he talks about the hour, this is St. John's Gospel, he, he's generally referring to the hour of his passion his hour on Calvary. And he's saying to the Blessed Mother, do you realize that if I work this miracle, if I do what you're asking or what you're suggesting, then everything changes. Everybody will know who I am and I'm on, my I'm on the road that leads me to this hour. My hour is coming. Once I do this, the hour is on its way. Uh, do you realize what that means? And Our Lady says, uh, turns to the, the, um, the very, very, uh, you know, uh, curt conversation. You know, they, they don't even answer each other's questions. They just move on to the next step, you know. And so Our Lady turns to the, um, to the waiters and says, do whatever he tells you. And Our Lord changes the water into wine. The jars that are filled with, with water are ceremonial purification, for ceremonial purification the symbol of baptism, you could say. And, and the fact that it's turned into wine is a symbol of the Eucharist. And the, and the miracle <coughs> itself reflects the transformation of the bread and wine on the altar into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. And this all happens at a wedding feast, which is the wedding, the, the supper of the Lamb. You know? And so it's pointing to Calvary and our Lord's sacrifice in, on Calvary. It's, it's, it's pointing to Our Lady's participation in this mystery and it's pointing uh, to the Eucharist. And, and so yes, very definitely, there's, there's a connection between this 
and, and revelations. And of course the author is the same. It's, it's God gave this grace to record these things to St. John, both in, um, in, 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 the, in the fourth gospel and in the book of Revelation. So, our, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it could, but you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write a book about it. I mean, you could and probably make a lot of money, but, but you know, I don't think it's really, it really corresponds to to the message of of, of the apocalypse. I think most of these things uh, help us to understand that this is true prophecy when they come to pass, and we can see that these things are probably being realized at different levels throughout history. You know, when you see these antichristic figures that more or less correspond to, uh, you know, to one of the beasts like Nero uh, and, and yet also possibly others like Hitler, you know, but the church doesn't really, you know, make definitions about these things because they're, they're, they're part of the prophetic grace, but it's, it's really not, not clear. You know, so. Well, I don't think you need the apocalypse to, to worry about the government putting a chip chip in your body. You know what I mean, I say I don't think you need to read the apocalypse to worry to to to, to have some concern about the government issuing universal IDs and, and putting chips in your body. You know. I mean, you think that would be okay to do that if it came about uh, after reading the book that says don't take it. No, you wouldn't be committing a sin. You know, you wouldn't be committing a sin by doing so, unless the church, unless the church. Well, I mean, when when the church, maybe some maybe some some mystic says so, but I'll, I'll follow the church. When the church says this is, this is a this is a betrayal of Christ, then then I will I will certainly follow that. But I'm going to follow the church. You know, I'm not going to accuse anybody. I'm, you know, of course, you can't accept the mark of the beast right. if you know it's the mark of the beast. But, who, but where does the church say that the chip is the mark of the beast? It doesn't. What, you know, what, I, what you're saying, though, is that um, you don't need the book of Revelation to know that the government putting the chip in their body is not a good thing. Yeah, I don't think it's a good thing. But I'm not, I'm not going to tell somebody that they, they are betraying Christ because they have accepted the mark of the beast. The church doesn't teach that. I'm sorry, it doesn't. You know, it's one thing to say this is a really bad idea. This is a really bad idea, which it probably is. You know, I think it is. It's another thing to say, say, it's another thing to say that the church, that Jesus Christ tells us that accepting a chip is the mark of the beast and that you've betrayed Jesus Christ by doing so. That's a completely different thing. Completely well, different thing. What I kind of mean is that it, whatever the mark of the beast happens. No, you can't accept it, of course. Whatever we would. But the mark of the beast is this identification, you know, with, with the spirit of the world, ultimately. Whatever that might be. You know, it's. Ex huh? Like offering, inc like offering incense, you know, at the Roman altars. This is what was constantly being, being expected of the Christians under the Roman persecution, and they refused to do it. They refused, you know, sometimes they would say, just pretend to do it. You know, just pretend to do it. And they wouldn't do it. You know, so, so when, when a Christian is, is tempted, or when a Christian is confronted with accepting the mark of the beast, it is, it is not going to be, uh, you know, some generic choice that may or may not be evil in and of itself. It's going to be accepting an evil act. But isn't that a lot of the same thing as getting a, the, you know, body piercing that, you know, doing something to your body, piercing? Well, body, body piercing, you know, you, there's arguments that some of these things are mutilation, 
you know, I don't know exactly where you draw the line with all these things. You know, getting an earring is not mutilation, obviously. You know, but, but some of these things are mutilation. That's the reason that they're wrong. Is body piercing the mark of the beast? Well, you know, it, 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 is, the adopt, it is the adopting of pagan customs. Some of it seems very, very pagan. So, is there some attribution you can make to these things? Um, yeah, probably, but again, these, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth with these kinds of things because I'm going to follow the teaching of the church on these things. And you can speculate about it, it's fine to speculate, but that's what it is, it's speculation. What do you mean, Trinity Mass? What do you? I'm not sure what you mean. The last Mass, right before you receive communion, the Father turns around and gives you. That's absolution. It's not a. It's not an exorcism. Someone told me it was an exorcism. No, it's absolution. Okay. May Almighty God, you know, that's what we say uh, in the Eng in the English rite as well. You know, uh, uh, may Al what is it after? The may Almighty God forgive. That's what it is. It's, the ab it's called the absolution. Is attached to the confidior, to the to the confession of our sins. We confess our sins, and then Father gives us absolution, which is not sacramental absolution like in confession. It's a blessing. But it was taken off the, the, the right? No, it's there. In the old rite, there used to be what they call the second confidior. So right before Holy Communion, so the priest, the priest, and the servers uh, have their do the confidior at the beginning of Mass, the prayers at the foot of the altar, and then just before communion, all the faithful participate by, uh, by doing their confidior before holy, right before Holy Communion <laughs> with, the, with, with the absolution. But that's actually, it's not, that's supposed to be admitted now. It's, it's, it was abolished in, in, in the 60s, the second confidior. I know some people do it. You know, it's not a big deal, but it's actually not supposed to be included. Yes. In the conversation with the Protestant, how would you describe the main differences between the Catholic interpretation of Revelation and the Protestant? Well, if I were to, um, <laughs> if I, Scott Hahn talks about this in his book, and he said that you know he he was very futuristic as a Protestant in the sense that all of these things have some kind of correspondence in history, and especially, you know in the future and, and very often in times and there's this temptation to always try to figure out what's going on in the world by plugging it into the apocalypse. That was the way he thought as, as a Protestant. And then he gradually, the, I think, you know, if you read Scott Hahn's books and, and, and see his, you know, his witness, hear his witness, you'll see that on many levels he was moving towards the Catholic faith for a long time. Uh, and, and, one, and one of the reasons was because he began to see uh, that, that the apocalypse was liturgical. And, and he began to move away from the idea that, that all these things, ne you need to figure out what all these symbols mean by making them correspond to what's happening now. So, and I think you'll, you find this in the teaching of the church. If you look the, w the way the sacred text, excuse me, the apocalypse is used in the liturgy, if you see the way the apocalypse is, 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 is used in the teaching of the church, particularly in the catechism, you'll see that it is, is used more or less, hopefully, in the way I've been presenting it, and not so much, you know. And again, the church does not deny, you know, the church believes there is pro prophetic utterances in the book of Apocalypse about the last things, about the end of the world, and about things that happen in history. But, but she relies on her holy teachers to present their opinions on these matters, but I don't, I don't know that any of it's been defined, you know, in terms, in terms of historical instances of these things happening. Yes? <laughs> I think it's a very bad thing. You, you know? I mean, in, in, you know, there are, there are, the, in, in, in the interpretation of sacred scripture, there, there is um, 
like I said, the literal sense, and then there's the spiritual senses, which are proper and real senses of, of sacred scripture that are intended by the Holy Spirit. So not only is the literal sense intended by the Holy Spirit, but the spiritual senses are as well. But aside from that, there's, there's sense, a sense which is called uh, attributed, where a preacher may see a correspondence with something that's practical or historical and attribute this. So I can't tell you whether there's a spiritual sense in which Obamacare uh, is something prophesied by uh, the apocalypse, but you could say it's kind of apocalyptic and antichristic, you know. And I, and I think when you talk about the mark of the beast, I think, I think what the Holy Spirit is trying to, is what, what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church in the mark of the beast is that because of this conflict that goes on throughout history, which is characterized very often by the, the secular state uh, trying to, to, to run over the people of God and the compromise of religious people in order to, to, to have what they want in life you know, from the state, there is always going to be this temptation to accept the mark of the beast. <coughs> if you are willing to identify yourself with the beast, then you will, you, will, you will be able to continue to live the way you want to live, but you will have betrayed Christ. You know? You so, well, I mean, it is. It, it is throughout history, and I think Obamacare is one of them, where you're, you're told you'll do, you, you can get along with everybody just fine as long as you're willing to go along with it. So is, is it a mark of the beast? In a sense, yeah, I think it is, but uh, you know, the church would have to, I mean, the church is never going to say that Obamacare is, <laughs> accepting Obamacare is accepting the mark of the beast. In terms of revelation? No, in terms of something like this volunteer. Oh, yeah, the bishops are active, you know, sure. Sure, and they're going to oppose, they're going to oppose, they are opposing the, the mandate. You know. You can't, you can't, ex you can't accept the, the contraceptive mandate. Church can't do it. Church can't do it, so they'll continue to fight it. Yeah. So what are you? So what are you saying by that? Not accepting the concept of mandate. Are you saying that? I, I the church can't I, pay I, for con I, the church I, cannot pay for contraception. No, can't. But I I have a private insurance carrier, so if my insurance carrier is doing contraception and I could drop my insurance, is that what? Is that what? Because that I'm. No, th th these are complicated uh, issues which you probably need to talk to a priest about in some cases, but you know, there is what they call formal and material cooperation. You know, not every form of cooperation when, when there's a reason to cooperate is, is considered formal cooperation. You know, you are buying, a, I would assume you're buying a policy which is not in itself offensive. And the fact that your carrier is doing things offensive is not, is not your concern. And you are not, um, uh, you know, you're not participating in their evil in a, in, a, in a formal way. You know, if if you did, you know, these are these are practical issues that have to be worked out, you know, personally and sometimes with the confessor. But I don't think there's any formal cooperation there. And in some cases, you know, then you'd have to look at every company that you do business with, and if they did something evil, you'd have to stop stop uh, purchasing their items and sometimes we do sometimes we do it though because we've chosen to do it because we've chosen to boycott it's one thing to say I'm, I'm boycotting a company it's another thing to say I have a moral obligation not to buy their products and this is where the church is very careful they're two different things 
you know, but but the, the, the you know, I, on, this, on these matters we have to follow the guidance of the church. In cases of doubt, you follow in good conscience what the church, the, the guidance that is given to us by the church. That's what, that's why Christ instituted the church. That's why Christ has given us a bishops and a pope. I don't know if Father Elias has something to say about that. I want to say something about that. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much for this evening.